that word holy. That word holy is a word that means not of the created order, something in a class all by itself, different, unique, and absolutely pure. And the cry around the throne, according to Isaiah, and according to the book of Revelation is, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, the whole earth is full of His glory. Well, today we want to turn in our Holy Bibles to the book of Matthew in chapter number 27, so I invite you to turn with me there. Matthew's Gospel and chapter number 27, Matthew, the first Gospel, and chapter number 27. You may have heard in the news this week that Stephen Hawking passed away. He was a genius, will go down in scientific history, alongside Galileo and maybe Einstein, Sir Isaac Newton. He had a way of understanding the universe in a mind that was so incredible, and also a great, courageous spirit to him. When he was just a young man, young adult, barely in his 20s, he was diagnosed as you know, with something very similar to Lou Gehrig's disease. And most people die a year or two within the span of that disease. But he lived over 50 years, and for the last bit of time, he's only been able to move one eyeball. Otherwise, he's completely paralyzed, and yet he just kept writing and studying and, and giving his great insights into the universe. But he was an atheist. And one of the interesting things is the last couple of pronouncements he's made before he died, one was in popular science and the other one was really widely picked up by um, newspapers everywhere. He said, first of all, that he no longer believes that humanity is going to survive for very long on this planet because of artificial intelligence, because of the advancement of technology that is getting out of our control, and because of climate change and everything else, the only hope for humanity, he said, is that we go into space and colonize other places. And then he said, just last week before he died, he published an article, and the essence of it is, there was nothing before the moment of the Big Bang, he said. Nothing south of the South Pole, as he put it. In other words, he was saying that no matter, no energy, no time, no space, nothing existed until suddenly everything came into the complexity of its existence. And one commentator reading that said, he is coming for an atheist. He is coming perilously close to admitting that there is a God, that there has to be a great causal agent behind all of it. But those are his last pronouncements. And we know people, and they're established their legacies are established based very largely on the insights they have as they come near to the end of their life and they give the fruit of all of their years of research and make those last words and their final pronouncements. Those are remembered. They are set in stone. They establish legacies. Well, there is someone who said some words at the end of his life who not only speculated about the universe, but who is the one through whom the universe was created. And the last words of Jesus Christ, the seven last statements on the cross, affect our lives in a way greater than any other person in all of human history, and they are collected for us in the four Gospels. Now, it's interesting that seven in the Bible is a number of completion, it's a number of uniqueness, it's a number that we call it the perfect number in Scripture, and Jesus had seven final statements to make. But those final statements are not an all in one gospel. We have to read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and we pull them out, and it creates a list of seven. And the one we're coming to today is the most poignant and maybe undecipherable of all of them. It is so beyond us, but I'd like to show it to you. And it's here in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, the crucifixion scene, the ground at the foot of the cross. So let's begin reading here with verse 32. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 32, the last words of Jesus. It says, as they were going out, the crucifixion party, they met a man from Cyrene, 
And Cyrene is an area that today we would know of as Libya and North Africa. So this was a North African gentleman named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, which was a painkiller. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots and sitting down. They kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Here's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon till three in the afternoon, darkness came over all of the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely, he was the Son of God. So this is the holiest ground in all of the Bible. This is Mount Calvary. And the story of our Lord's last words and His strange phrase uttered in Aramaic and Hebrew, and it was a quotation from Psalm 22, and He said, My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? There was a moment when because Jesus took upon himself all of the sins of the world, including the things you've done wrong and the things that I've done wrong, God the Father turned away, and there was a moment of separation there that we cannot explain. And Jesus not only died physically, but he was separated in a spiritual sense somehow from the Father in a way that provided the capability for us being redeemed and reconciled to God. And that's what is contained in this statement. But the whole pathos of it, the whole pain of it, the suffering and the overwhelming sense of history connected with all of this, why did Jesus do this? I mean, what would motivate anybody? Can you imagine you or me being asked to do anything, even coming close to this? Why would we do it? And Jesus, I think, had many motivations. He did it First of all, and primarily, I think, because of His love. He loves you. He always has. He always will. There is not one thing about you that would ever keep the Lord from loving you. And it was the love that drove Jesus Christ to the cross. But He also did it out of a sense of righteousness. He was motivated by righteousness because of the judgment and the wrath and the purity of God. It demanded a sacrifice for sins. And then I think he also went to the cross because he knew this was his destiny and he wanted to fulfill fully every messianic prophecy that had ever been uttered in order to have a book with integrity here, the Bible, in which nothing was broken. 
But then there's another odd reason why I think the Lord went to the cross, and we find this in two different verses in the Bible I'm going to show you. This was the world's greatest single act of obedience. So look with me at the book of Romans in chapter 5, and I'll show you how obedience played a part in this as Jesus was fulfilling the will of His Father obediently and fully. It says in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul here is writing, and what he's going to do is to compare Adam from the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden with Jesus. And he says, these two men, they are very similar and very different. And he says, consequently, in verse 18, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, Adam sinned. And all of humanity was condemned because of that and that one sin. So also one righteous act resulted in justification for all people. And this is the way the cross is theologically defined here. It is one righteous act. And he goes on in verse 19, For just as through disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also, here it is, through the obedience of the one man, the many were made righteous. This is the way Calvary is described. It is the obedience of one man. Jesus was obeying the will and the instructions of the Heavenly Father. Now, we also have this not only in Romans 5, but in Hebrews 5. So turn over to the book of Hebrews in chapter number 5 and look at verse 7. Hebrews and chapter number 5 and verse number 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions. He was a man who prayed, and he prayed with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Now look at verse 8. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So here the Lord is described as someone who through this act of Calvary learned obedience. What can that possibly mean? I don't think I can tell you. We know that as God and His God nature and His divinity, Jesus cannot learn anything because God is omniscient. He knows everything, so there's nothing left to learn. But in His human nature, because He is both God and man, He had the capacity of learning. We don't quite know or understand how these come together. It is mystery to us. But it says about Jesus in Luke's Gospel in chapter 2, that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So he had the capacity somehow of learning. And here at the cross, he experienced a series of lessons that no one has ever experienced before or since. He learned obedience through what he suffered. I don't know what all that means. But I know that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ the great model of obedience that we need to follow that's so important for us. If you want to live the kind of life that God has for you, that requires obedience. We're living in a day and an age that doesn't like obedience very much, but we've got to trust the Lord and to obey Him. And we have the great model and mentor, the great example of obedience found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the greatest single act of obedience in all of human history was what took place on Calvary's mountain. So what can we learn from it? Well, three things. First of all, if you want to obey as Christ did, then we have to take this book seriously. Take his book seriously and study it and see what is there in this book about how I am to live. And if you are living in some area in your life in a way contrary to the commandments and the laws and the statutes of God, then we need to bring our lives back into conformity with His Word. And that's what Jesus did. When He obeyed, what was He obeying? He was obeying Psalm 22. Do you know how Psalm 22 begins? This is the psalm the first words say, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was a psalm that Jesus studied because it describes crucifixion in advance a thousand years in detail before execution by crucifixion had even been invented. And this is what it says. We don't have time to go through the whole psalm, but I'll give you some bullet points here. Psalm 22 says that this is the way the Messiah would die. That his dying words would be, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That as he was dying, he would be despised by the people and mocked and insulted. The exact words of his tormentors would be given to us advance in Psalm 22. His being encircled by enemies as he died was described. We're told in Psalm 22 that he would be dehydrated in his death, that he would be contorted in his physical posture, that he would suffer intense thirst. We are told that his hands and feet will be pierced, that he would die in a state of nakedness or near nakedness, that he would be stared at and gloated over, that his clothing would be gambled away by his executioners, and that there would be a worldwide impact to his death. Now imagine, this is just one passage. The Old Testament is full of predictions and prophecies about what Jesus the Messiah would be like. Here is only one chapter. But is there any other human being in all of history whose death would fit the predictions made in this chapter? And the Lord knew all of this. He had studied it. He had certainly memorized verse 1. Maybe he knew the entire psalm, and he knew it was about him, and he lived in obedience to Psalm 22. And in the same way, we have to go into the Bible. And you read Galatians, you read Romans, you read the Gospels, you read what Jesus said, here's the way to live. And as we take this book seriously, and we bore into it, and we say, well, here's a commandment. Here's what God expects of me. Here's the lifestyle that I'm to emulate in my life. And we say, well, I'm not doing too well with this. Then we need to bring our lives into obedience to His Word. I'll give you just one example. The one last book of the Bible that I've tackled in my study through Scripture is Song of Solomon. Somehow I left that off till last in the last couple of months I've been going into Song of Solomon, and I taught it last week at our Cover to Cover Sunday night class. And I was just amazed at what a story it tells. Song of Solomon is the story of Solomon as a young man going up to the north to check on his vineyards and on his herds and his flocks. And there is a Shunammite girl working in one of the vineyards, and she sees him and he sees her, and it is love at first sight and they date, and they engage. He proposes, she accepts, they get engaged, and then they get married, then they have a very passionate honeymoon, and it's described for us rather graphically in the Bible, and then they have an argument. They have a misunderstanding, but they come back together, they work through all of that, and the lesson is that love, true love, cannot be quenched. But three times in that book, it tells us Realize the role of sex is after marriage. It says, be careful not to awaken your love until the right time. It's not love, sex, and marriage. It is love, marriage, and sex. And this is what the seventh commandment says, you shall not commit immorality. And this is what Ephesians chapter 5 says, among you there should not even be a hint of sexual immorality. And yet, as I travel around and I talk to ministers and we talk about couples and getting married and weddings in churches, they are all saying to me, almost everyone who comes to get married, they've been living together. This is a generation that doesn't realize. For some reason, they seem totally oblivious, even if they have grown up in church. They don't seem to realize that the order is love, marriage, and sex, and this is the God-ordained order. And it seems to me that we have a whole generation, a whole society, a whole culture here who just is not taking this book seriously and studying it and saying, here's what God says, and so here is the way I'm going to live. And the Lord here, Jesus, gives us an example. 
He went into Psalm 22. He said, here's exactly what the Father says, and he did exactly as his Father had commanded him. So obedience begins when we go into the Bible. We say, here's how God wants us to live, and we make up our minds to live in that way. Now, the second thing is, as we do it, it may not be easy. There is something about obedience that sometimes can be very, very hard. It's much easier for some reason, this fallen world we're in, but it's much easier to disobey. What Jesus did on that Friday was no easy task. There was not an easy moment in that 24-hour period from the time that he went into that upper room until he went to Gethsemane, until he was seized, until he went through those trials, until he was crucified, and until he was buried. It was the hardest thing that anybody has ever done in all of human history, but he obeyed. And it's hard for us to obey, just as it was for our Lord. You have a five-year-old, six-year-old, and they have a toy chest. They take all their toys out. That's easy. You say, now, put your toys back obey me, and put all your toys back in the toy chest. That is the hardest thing in the world for that five-year-old, that six-year-old. I don't know why. Why is that? It doesn't take any more energy to take them out as it does to put them back in. It's the same activity, just in reverse. But there is something about obedience that just is very hard. But we've got to obey anyway. The Bible teaches that God has a plan for our lives. And when you study the characters of the Bible, none of them had an easy time of it. It was just hard at every point to say, this is the way I'm going to live. It went against the texture and the tone of the culture. It went against the, went against the direction of society. And sometimes it took a lot of energy, and it took enormous amounts of personal commitment, and yet they obeyed. And Jesus did. And he's our example there. I remember when I decided I was going to leave home and go to college. I didn't make that decision because I wanted to. But I remember one night, I can remember it as clear as if it were yesterday. And I was in bed and I was reading an academic catalog. And the Lord said, this is where I want you to go to school. And I didn't have any doubt about it. The Lord didn't speak audibly, but he almost did. And it was so hard for me to leave my home and family and my parents who were elderly and go away. Obedience just is never very easy. But God has given us a book full of wonderful ways in which to live, and our obligation is to say, yes, Lord, this is what I'm going to do by your help. And then the third thing is that as we obey Him like this, He has for us a set of promises that He will never leave us or forsake. This is the strangest word in the Bible in some ways. How Jesus Christ at that moment, somewhere between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon, cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God laid all of the sins of the world, all of our transgressions on him, and turned his face away for a moment, and Jesus fulfilled Psalm 50, uh, 22, 1. He was forsaken for a moment, but only so that we will never have to be forsaken. Because the Lord was forsaken in that existential moment on Calvary, the Lord will never forsake us. Just like in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Save me from this hour. It was for this hour I came into the world. Now is my soul troubled. But a little bit later, He said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Because he was troubled with the prospects of Calvary. We never have to be troubled in life. Because he was forsaken on Calvary's cross, we never have to be forsaken in life. And there are so many verses that reassure us of that. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you, not till your dying day. The Lord Himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you. And in Joshua chapter 1, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. And 1 Kings chapter number 8 says, may the Lord our God be with us as He was with our ancestors. May He never leave us or forsake us. 
1 Chronicles 28, 20. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged because the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you until all of the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is completed. And Psalm 9, those who know your name will trust in you for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who serve you. And Psalm 37 says, for the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. And just one more, I could go on and on, but listen to this verse in Isaiah chapter 42. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known, along unfamiliar paths. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness to light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. So obedience means going into the Bible and seeing how God wants us to live and bringing our lives into conformity with that. And it is doing so, knowing that we're following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it may not be easy. But as we go about living a life of obedience, then we will never be forsaken, not by our Father, He's here. He will never leave us or forsake us and help us through every step from here till we get to heaven. I just want to close by giving you one example. About a month ago, I was in Florida and spoke to a group of veteran missionaries. These were men and women. They were all, I guess, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Had served a lifetime in the most dangerous areas of the world particularly most of them in North Africa. And they had stories to tell. I stood up and looked out across this group and thought of the thousands of years of accumulated experience just represented by those people right there. And one fellow, he was my host, he gave me a book. He said, you'll love this book. It's the story of the evangelization of a particular area of Ethiopia during the days of Emperor Haile Selassie. You know, I cannot put that book down. And here is just one story. It has to do with a boy by the name of Nana, N-A-N-A. When he was 12 years old, his older brother told him about Jesus and led him to profess Christ as his Savior. But their father, who was the local witch doctor, was horrified by it. And he hired, the father hired a thug to take that 12-year-old, capture him, whip him, beat him, and finally this thug tied ropes around his ankles and hoisted him up in a tree so that he was swinging by his feet and built a fire under him and swung him back and forth through the flames trying to get him to renounce his commitment to Christ. But that 12-year-old, he was feisty. He was determined. And nothing could dissuade him from the decision he had made. Well, years later, there was a missionary that came into the area from Australia. Dick McMillan was his name. And Nana was a farmer and also a local evangelist. And in this particular area of Ethiopia, there were a number of farmer evangelists, and with the help of this missions organization, they determined to go to an area of Ethiopia that had never heard the gospel and to evangelize it, and 42, 42 different indigenous national evangelists took their families and moved into that area and built houses, their little, you know, huts they had with the thatched roof, and they planted their crops, and they went about evangelizing, and it was an area open to the gospel, and churches began springing up, and Christians everywhere, and then the opposition came, and the opposition was fierce and brutal, and they went in and burned down the churches, and they persecuted the Christians, and of these 42 national evangelists, 41 of them were arrested and chained with their ankles so tightly together they could only hop and take into the prison. But one evangelist was never arrested, and it was Nana. 
And he wasn't arrested. It wasn't because he ran away or because he hid. But the chapter about him is entitled, The Invisible Man. And for some reason, the police, the authorities, the persecutors, they would never recognize him when he walked among them. They knew him. His picture was up everywhere. He was the most wanted man in that region, but he operated right out in the open. And he would go literally into the prison. He would take yams and sweet potatoes and food to the other 41. He would take care of their needs. He would go in and out right in front of these police officers, but they never recognized him. He would be at police checkpoints, and they were there just to capture him. He'd go right through, and somehow they didn't recognize him. They were prevented from recognizing him. It's as though he were invisible to them. And he took care of those 41 evangelists, and he took care of their families. He was everywhere, and he never was arrested. And he kept the churches going until the wave of persecution passed, and finally the evangelists were released. And today there are a thousand churches up and down that broad valley in Ethiopia because God knew how to take care of His people. And He knows how to take care of you. When we obey Him, we walk with Him in obedience and faith. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He knows the way that He has for you. And the example of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The lessons there are as deep as heaven and hell. We can never get to the bottom of them, but here is one of them. He taught us how to obey, and we obey. When we go into the Bible and take it seriously and say, there's some things here that I need to change about my life. And we recognize that it may not be easy to change this pattern, this habit this lifestyle, this thing in my life. But even if it isn't easy, with the Lord's help, we're going to do it. And as we do so, we have that assurance. The one who was forsaken says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so we walk with the Lord. That's the Christian life. And the light of His Word and what a glory He sheds on our path. As we do His good will, He abides with us still. And to all who will trust Him and obey. Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, every one of us, we want Your help. We need the One who will never leave us or forsake us. We need it today. And Father, I pray that You would also show us that we have an obligation to take this book and study it every day, to search out the way You want us to live, to see what we need to change next in our lives so that we increasingly reflect Jesus, to make those changes even when it's hard, but to do so with your presence very personally, very powerfully around us. And dear Lord, if there is someone here or watching online who needs to make some changes, give them the courage, the commitment, and the grace to do so as we follow Jesus Christ together in whose name it is that we pray. Amen.